Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here with us. My name's Katrina Pryor and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at CREMS and I'll be chairing the session for today. So before I introduce our speaker for today, I wanted to point out a couple of things to you. So firstly, I wanted to let you know that the webinar will be recorded, so you'll be able to access the webinar itself or the slides as a PDF if you're interested in doing so. And there's also a questions tab on your dashboard there. So if you have any questions while our presenter is talking today, feel free to type them in there and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Um, and I also wanted to draw your attention to one of our upcoming webinars that will be held on the 27th of November by Professor Marie Thiessen. And the webinar will focus uh, on the new uh, Centre for Research Excellence, which is all about prevention and early intervention. So uh, Professor Thiessen will talk about why prevention and early intervention is important and what evidence-based options are available to young people. And you can also watch some of our past webinars that are available on demand. So for those of you joining us for the first time, I thought I'd give a quick overview of what CREMS is and the type of research we do. So CREMS stands for the Centre for Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use. And at CREMS, we focus on conducting research to improve our understanding of mental health and substance use disorders. And we work across three different areas. So we work across the areas of prevention, treatment and epidemiology, and we particularly focus on how and why these problems co-occur. And one of the things we like to look at as part of that is what, what prevention and treatment options are available for these co-occurring disorders. So to achieve these aims, we work across our uh, work closely with different services, schools and community groups. And this webinar series is a great way that we can foster these lines of communication. So on the next slide, you'll see a photo of our team at CREMS, including some of our youngest members down the front there. And you'll see our director, Professor Marie Thiessen, circled in the purple. So Professor Thiessen is a principal research fellow at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. And she was most recently appointed by the Minister for Health, Greg Hunt, as a National Mental Health Commissioner in recognition of her work. She's also been awarded a Companion of the Order Australia, which demonstrates her really large contribution to Australia's health and medical research efforts in the field of mental health and substance use. And she's particularly well regarded for her research on the co-occurrence between mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Associate Professor Frances K. Lemkin, who's sharing the screen with me. So Frances is internationally recognised for her innovative technology-based interventions in mental health and substance use disorders. And she's the current president of two large associations, so the Society for Mental Health Research and also uh, the International Society for Research on Internet Interventions. Um, and Frances, uh, her vision is to bring high quality evidence-based treatments for multiple disorders to the point of care so that she can ensure that the right person receives the right intervention at the right time. So thank you for joining us, Francis. We're very lucky to have you here today, and I'm sure it's going to be a really interesting session. So I'll pass over to you. I hope so. Thank you so much, Katrina, and thank you for having uh, me as part of this really important um, and I think quite interesting webinar series coming from CREMS. We all clamour over ourselves to get a spot, so thank you for giving me one to talk about something that I'm quite passionate about, and that kind of represents um, a way in which we're trying to take some evidence-based treatments and resources that we've had over the years and try to tailor them for a new population, that being um, young or contemporary veterans. So what I'm here and what you hopefully signed up for today is to hear about how and perhaps why we need to treat and focus on comorbid depression and particularly alcohol use um, in young veterans in particular. And to do that, I wanted to go a little bit broader than the veteran population because uh, depression and alcohol use disorders is something that affects many, many Australians, and I'll tell you just how many in, in a moment. So I'm going to cover off on some of the prevalence and harms associated with both co-occurring depression and alcohol use disorders and how the potential of, of online technologies can be leveraged to really reach out better to young people in general and young or contemporary veterans in particular. I'm also going to, in doing that, talk a little bit about what the 
potential benefits are of a clinician-assisted approach to um, technology-based interventions, particularly for depression um, and addictive type disorders um, among veterans and then also versus face-to-face -face treatment. So come with me for this journey. Uh, what I thought I'd do first is go right back to some basics about what I mean and what we mean when we talk about alcohol misuse, alcohol consumption and alcohol use disorders. Um, so I'm sure that the people who are here today know quite well that alcohol consumption involves drinking um, and that drinking at least one full serve of alcohol. And here's what a standard drink looks like in terms of beer, wine and spirits. Now, alcohol misuse is not just drinking one, um, one full serve of alcohol. What it is, is drinking in excess of guidelines that are put out by the National Health and Medical Research Council with a guide to minimising the harms associated with alcohol use. And there are several guidelines that are currently in place. These are the most recent ones that are in place here uh, for Australians. Um, and the first one is around reducing the risk of alcohol-related harm over a lifetime. So that's the lifetime risk of harm associated with drinking alcohol alcohol will be minimised when you limit your standard drinks to no more than two on any day. The next guideline is in relation to reducing the risk of injury on one single occasion of drinking. So when people drink, what we're trying to do is recommend that they drink no more than four standard drinks on that one occasion in order to reduce that risk of alcohol-related harm. Um, harm. So for children and young people, it's absolutely not at all. Um, but for those who are aged 15 to 17 years, we are trying to encourage people to delay their first full um, serve of alcohol as long as possible. And at the moment, uh, for those who are pregnant, people who are pregnant or breastfeeding, um, there is um, no safe level of alcohol use that we can determine from the literature, and so not drinking is the safest option. So these are the kind of guidelines and principles that the government hopes that we'll live by as Australians um, in order to reduce the impact of harm on any one occasion or over our lifetime. Now, of course, um, the reason I guess we're all here is because some of these guidelines are difficult for some people to adhere to. And when you get a, a series or a pattern of consumption occurring for alcohol in particular over a period of time that starts to cause fun uh, dysfunction and problems in multiple areas of a person's life, that's when someone meets criteria for an alcohol use disorder. So that's when people will get a, a diagnosis. It used to be an alcohol abuse or an alcohol dependence type disorder. Now with the latest DSM, five, um, in effect, we talk about alcohol use disorders. And if people fulfill um, two to three of these criteria here in front of you, they have a mild alcohol use disorder, four to five, it's a moderate alcohol use disorder, and severe is six or more of these criteria in the same 12 month period. And usually for treatment seeking people, who people were, um, we're talking about who might be engaged or looking to engage with alcohol and other drug treatment services for support with their disorders, you're possibly going to get people around that moderate and severe level seeking help, although certainly in that mild alcohol use disorder level, we can do a lot to, um, to intervene early and then a step before that to, to prevent these alcohol use disorders from occurring. So why do we want to do that? Why do we want to intervene early or even prevent? Is an alcohol kind of okay some of the time? Well, um, over the short term, um, I'm confident that anybody who's had a, a serve of alcohol before will have experienced some of these short-term effects. These can be some of the really, um, I guess, intoxicating um, in terms of things we really like about um, alcohol and how it feels when we have um, a drink. So it can reduce our inhibitions. It can relax us to some extent. Um, we might be a bit slowed down in our movements. With a few more um, uh, beverages, we might um, be compromised in terms of our memory and judgment. Um, if we keep consuming um, in excess of those, uh, those single occasion risk guidelines, things can get a bit um, shaky, we can start vomiting um, and even passing out uh, or having other sorts of disruption to our sleep. And over the longer term, this can then, uh, with, with, with use along those um, more harmful levels, um, alcohol is one of the largest contributors to cancer um, and particularly liver cancers um, at, uh, that we uh, currently have. So alcohol use and misuse really does contribute to a lot of long-term physical disorders. Um, as I said, um, liver cancer, it accounts for about 40% of the burden. But really importantly, around 30% of the burden um, related to road traffic injuries can be traced back to alcohol misuse. And really importantly, particularly for young people, um, but across the lifespan, 15% of the burden due to suicide and self-inflicted injuries can be um, drawn back directly to alcohol misuse. 
Now, I alluded this to, to this a, a little bit before, and I guess the guidelines that the NHMRC put out for alcohol use suggest that maybe it's okay to drink one or two glasses or, of wine um, in particular um, a day. So isn't a little alcohol healthy, healthy for us? Um, and certainly there was a study that probably came out, um, I think it was five years ago, or oh, 2005, a little longer ago than that, that was talking about things like um, moderate alcohol consumption, lowering the risk of type um, 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and also certainly um, more recent research indicating that um, alcohol consumption within those moderate um, levels is associated with quite significant reductions in CHD, so coronary heart disease. What we've uh, found out more recently though in delving into some of those reviews and those studies is that those studies on which those um, assumptions or those conclusions were based really seemed to just compare moderate level drinkers to non-drinkers as opposed to never drinkers. So perhaps some of those people who were being recruited into those studies as non-drinkers were actually abode, may, could have been those who had to quit alcohol because they were already sick. Thus the difference between moderate level drinkers and the non-drinkers might not have been as significant um, as if we were recruiting and comparing them with never, um, never drinkers. Also, the way in which a lot of these reviews and the studies were designed is that they were only designed to detect positive outcomes or positive consequences of, you, of, um, of drinking in that moderate range and really weren't always set up to address or detect negative consequences or adverse events. So on balance, when we think about um, all the studies that have occurred since those early, um, uh, early studies and systematic reviews, the conclusion at the moment to this day is that even at moderate levels, the potential benefits that might be incurred by drinking a little bit of alcohol are really far outweighed by the potential harms and its contribution to burden of disease. So I'm not really fun at parties if you come and talk to me um, if, you, if you're drinking uh, in excess of those single occasion risk guidelines. But when we're having alcohol, really it's um, about trying to minimise those harms. Um, so what are we like at drinking in Australia? How good are we or otherwise at being able to keep our alcohol consumption in check? Um, I'm sure that you've all seen the same sorts of media attention on alcohol use and the culture of alcohol use in Australia that I have. Um, but importantly, there is a really important message to learn and that is these are the really recent statistics, um, national statistics on alcohol consumption that were just released um, a couple of weeks ago back in uh, August. Um, and what that indicates is that the proportion of people who are drinking in excess of the lifetime risk and the single occasion risk has been steadily declining since 2010 and that's really good news. What we do know, however, when we delve into those statistics is that um, just under half of Australians approve of quite regular alcohol use by adults. But interestingly, the majority of us, 77% in fact, of those of us aged 14 years and over, have consumed a full serve of alcohol in the previous 12 months. And that means only 23% of our population in a 12 month period 14 years or over are abstinent, completely abstinent from alcohol. And interestingly, um, although in some age groups this gap is closing, is closing adult males generally are more likely to consume alcohol in the past year than females. But particularly around, uh, for females around my age, so with the 35 to 45 year age group, that gender gap is almost completely closed and, and females are consuming in line with, with male consumption. And the issue around that is that um, at much lower levels of alcohol consumption, females can have um, quite the same significant amount of harm done to their bodies and also to the, to the reputations as do males. So when we look at lifetime risky alcohol consumption in the Australian population, our latest stats say that around 17% of Australians aged 14 years and over consume more than those two standard drinks a day. And they do that um, most days of the week. And this equates to about one in four males and one in 10 females across the, across the lifespan. Although, as I said, in some age groups, that gap is uh, virtually closed. In terms of single occasion risky drinking, so drinking four or more drinks on any one occasion, um, just over a third of Australians aged 14 years and over um, drink in excess of these single occasion risky drinking recommendations. So about a quarter of us do so at least once a month um, in the 12 months prior to survey and around one in seven of us do so at least once a week and again the tendency is for males to do this more frequently than females. So a really significant proportion of our um, population are putting themselves at extremely high risk of harm on anyone on an occasion of, of drinking and some of them doing this at least once a month and many of us are doing this at least once a week. 
Um, what we know about alcohol consumption and, and risky drinking is that the consumption of beer and, and uh, per capita has decreased over time and wine consumption has increased. And this is a function of what's more available in the marketplace, but also I guess is probably accounted for by the number of the increases in the number of women particularly drinking again around that 35 to 45 year age group, wine tends to be what we drink. Um, what is important is that although the lifetime and single occasion risky drinking is what I would consider quite high um, and certainly high for Australia in comparison to the rest of the world, we are on a downward trend. So um, the, in the last five years we've seen quite significant reductions in the number of Australians exceeding the lifetime and single occasion monthly risk. Um, but, and also we have around a third of people who come into our drug and alcohol treatment services um, who are seeking treatment treatment for alcohol use problems. Um, okay, so what are some of the harms associated with alcohol misuse that we are all concerned about and what we are really seeking through some of the strategies I'll talk about in a moment to reduce. Um, so these stats, uh, again, are a bit of a snapshot of harms amongst recent drinkers. So what happens to people whilst they're under the influence of alcohol? So what we tend to see is that um, around 3% of people are injured and require medical attention. We have relatively high rates, so high percentages, so about a quarter of us uh, become the victim of an alcohol-related incident, and that can often be a violent incident um, as well as an injurious um, event. And 10% of us drive a motor vehicle whilst we um, are intoxicated um, and this is um, uh, quite a concern we consider we're all on the roads. Um, importantly as well as uh, you know although our drug and alcohol services do see a lot of people really um, they're seeing people as particularly for alcohol very very late in, in the day so um, typically it's around 18 years after the onset of an alcohol use disorder so remember the criteria I mentioned a bit earlier on so you can imagine the the harms and the impairments and the, the issues that have been accumulating over this 18 years since a, a, a drug or a, an alcohol use disorder first emerged not misuse since a disorder first emerged people are accumulating these harms over time before they're then seeking treatment. So by the time they do seek treatment, you can imagine that treatments are much more complicated and severe and probably even life-threatening in, in some terms in terms of their um, you know, damage to the liver and, and so forth um, over that time than it would have been if we could get people in um, into treatment um, nice and early or even prevent treatment, uh, prevent um, alcohol misuse happening. And certainly when we think about our population, there are some um, groups in our community who are more um, more affected by the harms related to alcohol misuse than others. So in particular, our people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds seem to be more susceptible to the harms associated with alcohol misuse than people of a different cultural background. People with a mental illness um, are significantly more likely to uh, develop an alcohol use disorder and also experience harms, particularly um, violence and injury in relation to alcohol misuse than people without mental illness. Our young people, I think by the, the sheer exposure to um, single occasion risky drinking behaviours are at extremely high risk. And also people in rural and remote areas of our country um, are, are at highest risk, um, a very, very high risk of harms related to alcohol misuse, possibly because of their lack of access to services um, and other sorts of supports that you might find in more urban areas. Now today in the interest of time I'm just going to focus on two of these groups that's people with a mental illness and young people in particular this is the flow on to, to why we're focusing on um, contemporary veterans um, hopefully will become clear. Um, hopefully you've also heard in the media over time when we think about young people that young people are at the, this point in time are actually on, a, again, a downward trend in terms of their risky drinking. So um, what happens is as we age generally, traditionally, Australians are significantly less likely to exceed the single occasion risk guidelines for alcohol as we age. So what used to be called binge drinking becomes less frequent once we get sort of 24, 25 years and over. But particularly over the last 15 years, more young people than ever before are abstaining from alcohol completely. So it's almost to doubling in the rates of abstinence um, in that um, young people's age group, um, so 12 to 17 um, particularly, than ever before. 
So in 2016 in particular, 42% of Australians aged 18 to 24 were reporting single occasion risk guideline, um, use of alcohol in excess of those guidelines. But even that is a, de as a, decline, a decline of more than 10% from the rates uh, who were doing so in 2001, which is really, really important. Um, and certainly our young people in high school um, in, uh, indicate, tell us they're, they're abstaining um, Extended, staying to a higher extent um, than previously, and also significantly delaying their first drink of alcohol by um, almost two years, which is really, really important in terms of our brain development um, and our ability of, of our brain to jump back and, and bounce back from the types of assaults that alcohol imposes on our brain. So some really, really critically important trends are happening for our young people. Having said that though, um, alcohol use disorders will still peak in adolescence. So this is using the old DSM-4 criteria of abuse and dependence, but we see around that 15, 16, 17 through to 24 years age mark is where we see most common um, really high rates of alcohol use disorders. And this is also around the time when young people are starting to um, get out in the world, trying to find their, their first job, maybe they're studying a little bit, maybe they're moving out of home, maybe they're taking a little bit longer to do that these days than perhaps in previous generations. But having an alcohol use disorder at this critical transition time point can really have an impact on a person's later trajectory through life. And that's why trying to get in now, get in early and either prevent or at least intervene early before an alcohol use disorder sets in is really, really critical. Because what we also see is not only does the peak of these alcohol use disorders occur um, in our young people, but the burden is as great is, is greatest in young people than it is in other age groups. And that is because often the young people, because of these disorders, are not going out and finding jobs, not engaging in, in um, education, not actually developing relationships and, and establishing families that might then set them on towards, a, a, I guess, a healthier lifestyle for the rest of their lifespan. So that's why, again, we want to focus on, on young people for this particular work. Again, young people, not that they're problems, but um, I guess they're focused on other things apart from their short-term, medium-term and long-term well-being. We do know that young people are half as likely to visit a GP for a mental health problem than the general population. Fewer than a quarter access mental health services compared with about a third um, of their older age counterparts. But when young people do access these types of services, particularly for young people, but generally not, services just aren't catering as well for, for young people and their wants and their needs, particularly in terms of mental illness and alcohol and the drug use issues. And that's why um, services like Headspace were set up specifically for young people to cater for their wants and needs. But even so, this idea of, of trying to address the myriad of things that might be happening for a young person when they come across the doorstep really hasn't been, um, I guess, taken on board by a lot of the services that are available. And so what we've tried to do in CREMS and others are doing that in Australia and also internationally is try to take a different approach um, and rather than design our services around the need for young people to come into us um, and receive them in the traditional way, although that is critically important and some people will always need that, um, uh, that sort of functionality and that traditional service model, we are also thinking about um, ways to try to take services to where young people already are, where they're already engaging and where they're already talking about their thoughts and their feelings and you're probably already thinking ahead to technology hopefully and Facebook and so forth and so hopefully that'll become clear while we've taken that bent um, when I get to that point as well. And also I think um, there are a lot of attitudinal as well as structural issues that can really stop a young person and also people across the lifespan from accessing some of these traditional mental health and drug and alcohol services and to a certain extent the e-health services that I'll talk about in a moment. To move from young people, give them a little bit of a break, um, I'm going to move on to the other critical group um, in the Australian population, and that is those um, people who are experiencing mental health problems in conjunction with uh, an alcohol use, uh, misuse or an alcohol use disorder. So again, being diagnosed with a mental health problem really places a person um, at 1.2 to 1.3 times more risk of problematic alcohol consumption. And the reasons why this occurs are, again, um, myriad Yet. not really yet, there, is, there are several reasons. One is um, a self-medication hypothesis. So there's a, a, the idea that people are using alcohol to help them cope with or manage the symptoms that they're experiencing for their mental illness. So if somebody is um, experiencing anxiety, for example, they might feel like having a drink of alcohol helps them calm down and keep those sorts of symptoms at bay. 
If people are having sleep problems associated with, say, depression or other sorts of disorders, then maybe they think that drinking some alcohol will help manage those types of symptoms. Um, other models of comorbidity suggest that it's the alcohol use itself that can trigger a mental health problem. And certainly we do see some people for whom that is true, particularly for conditions like depression. So because alcohol is a, a depressant type of drug, um, the impact that it has on the brain and the body over time can actually uh, lead to the development of a depressive disorder in, a, in and of its own right, particularly if people are only using alcohol to then um, cope with some of the symptoms of the depression. So you can see also our third model, that's one of mutual influence, can be very, very quick to set in once a person um, is, is feeling um, depressed or anxious or has a mental health problem and is introducing alcohol or indeed other sorts of drugs into the mix. So regardless of how the pathway into this comorbidity might, um, might have occurred for a person, often by the time, particularly by the time people come to see us in services um, or even who might be seeking help um, online or through our e-health um, e-health resources, it, it really probably doesn't matter what the pathway in was. Often um, both the mental health and, and the alcohol use condition are there and mutually influencing uh, each other. Um, and that's also an important trigger and an important point to how we might need to manage comorbidity for people who are experiencing um, comorbid disorders. So the lifetime risk for people with mental health problems um, uh, for alcohol use disorders is 19%, so a couple of percent higher than for the general population. And also um, people with mental health problems are significantly less likely to, to um, drink at a low risk level and also to abstain from drinking completely than the general population. There's almost a 10% difference there in their ability to maintain low risk drinking and abstinence. So again, perhaps pointing to some goals for treatment and therapy for people who have a mental health problem and, and might also be drinking. Whilst I'm on the comorbidity bandwagon, and it's a bit of a passion um, of mine, I just want to um, again talk to people and remind people that comorbidity, so um, experiencing both a mental health and an alcohol or the drug use disorder concurrently, is more the rule rather than the exception. So most people who have a mental health problem, around half people who mental, uh, have a mental health problem, will also meet criteria for another mental disorder. Um, and also um, we're seeing increasingly now that having a mental disorder puts people at increasingly higher risk of having a physical disorder at the same time. And in Australia, this translates into uh, you know, around about 340,000 Australians a year experiencing the combination of a mental health and drug and alcohol problem. And that's excluding tobacco, which is another key um, comorbidity, especially amongst people with mental health problems. I'm going to save that for another talk, but I just want to acknowledge the role of, of tobacco and harms um, in this talk. And alarmingly, what we're seeing is those rates of comorbidity seem to be increasing by about 10% a year. Now, to move to um, one of the, the hows and the whys of this particular talk and a population that I'm, I'm increasingly interested in, in supporting is our Defence Force personnel. Um, so all of these, so how different or similar um, are our Defence Force personnel and our veteran um, population, how different or similar are they in terms of their alcohol use disorders and their mental health disorders um, they're from the general population? So I can answer that for you, uh, hopefully. Uh, and I have a PhD student of mine, Jake Jublin, who's looking at this very issue at the moment. So he's just working his way through and just completed a systematic review of the literature on the prevalence of mental disorders, including alcohol use disorders in Australian veterans. And just for Australian veterans, really was only able to find two reports that went into this issue. And both of those were commissioned um, by the Commonwealth, so by the, um, by the Department of Veteran Affairs directly. So there really hasn't been, I guess, a, a large scale cross-sectional epidemiological study um, on the prevalence of mental disorders in Australian veterans that's been conducted outside of the Department of, of Veteran Affairs. So that's something that, that might be important to do and something that other, um, other countries are doing. So certainly you see in Canada and in the US, you have the commissioned reports um, by, the, by the government, but then you also have um, large epidemiological studies outside of the Commonwealth of, of the government Government, um, the government studies looking at this particular issue. What those two reports uh, tend, were, were revealing or were telling us was particularly that mental health disorders seem to be exacerbated once a person leaves the AEF, the Australian Defence Force. So 
So what we see in those reports is the lifetime prevalence of any mental disorder in current serving ADF members is around 54%. Now that's still slightly higher, quite a bit higher I guess, than the lifetime prevalence of any mental disorder in a civilian population, which is 46%. But once a person transitions from active service to, to veteran status, their lifetime prevalence of any mental disorder seems to increase to about 75%. So the reports are indicating that around 75% percent of our veteran um, population uh, is meeting criteria for a lifetime mental disorder and those are things like affective disorders, anxiety disorders, um, also alcohol and other drug use disorders and, and so forth and I imagine um, anxiety disorders particularly around um, trauma and perhaps PTSD are some of the um, most common ones um, in current serving and, and ex-serving ADF members. And when we compare, compare that veteran population to the civilian population in Australia, we see the same kinds of things emerging. So um, for those people who are, for those veterans who are reporting high to very high psychological distress, around a third of our veteran population will, um, will endorse those kinds of um, current distresses versus about 13% in the civilian population and 19% in our current serving ADF members. In terms of a past 12-month mental disorder, we have rates in our um, ex-serving um, ADF members of around 46%, and that's just over twice that of what you see in the civilian population. Um, and if we peer down a little bit further into the types of disorders that um, our ADF, ex-serving ADF members are reporting, in the past 12 months, just under a quarter will meet criteria for an affective disorder, so like a depression or other mood disorder versus 6% in the general or civilian population. And for alcohol use disorders, again, it's quite high. So 13% in the past 12 months versus 5% um, in the general population, the civilian population. So here we've got another group within our Australian population, quite a large group, and with all the current conflicts um, and recent conflicts, there's an increasing population um, who are leaving the ADF. I'm not saying it's causing um, mental disorders um, or undetected mental disorders, but who are leaving the ADF with quite high levels of, of affective disorder and alcohol use disorder that we really need to be encouraging um, them to be seeking treatment and support for. So this is one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're now focusing on, um, on veterans and particularly younger veterans, so those aged 18 to 45 years um, in the work that we'll do, that we're, uh, that we're doing, we'll talk about um, soon. Importantly, um, despite uh, a lot of um, important investment and a lot of um, services specifically established for our veterans once they transition from, um, from serving status to ex-serving status, we still only get the same rates of treatment access for mental health and related problems in the veteran population as we do in the general population. So in the general population, around um, a third of people will seek treatment for a mental disorder in any one year. That's only a third of people who have a mental disorder in any one year will seek treatment. And the same is true in ex-service personnel. So only about a third will seek treat, a third of the people with a mental disorder will seek treatment for that mental disorder in any 12 month period. And this is even lower among our younger veterans, so 45 years and younger. So certainly the same kinds of patterns that we're seeing in people, in young people in the civilian population about not really engaging with traditional services, not really being treatment seeking and, um, and so forth, but still experiencing relatively high rates of mental disorder, those sorts of patterns seem to also be occurring, um, particularly in our younger veterans, veteran population. And in the past, um, before our most recent convict, uh, conflicts, it's been the ex-service organisations, so the ESOs, like the RSLs, um, the other sorts of um, support organisations that are out there, um, have really been um, key drivers in engaging veterans, providing them some supports and encouraging them to seek help um, when they identify help is needed. Um, but what's really interesting and, and a bit of a concern is that in a recent scoping review by Aspen Medical of all the ex-service organisations, overwhelmingly the 200 or so who were included in that scoping review reported significant difficulties engaging younger veteran populations in their efforts, so particularly in the RSLs. Um, but then there are some um, notable examples, so groups like Soldier On and Wounded Warriors and Mates for Mates, which have a strong, I guess, Facebook and online presence 
presence are also um, doing a bit of a better job at engaging our younger veteran populations and, and organisations that don't have such a presence. But clearly we're seeing, I think, um, generally that the way in which we're supporting um, veterans in the past might not be as relevant or as effective in supporting our veterans going forward, particularly our younger cohorts coming through. And so we really need to be thinking about other ways to try to engage people, um, our younger veterans, in, in treatment, given the quite high rates of mental disorders, of affective disorders and alcohol use disorders that they tend to be leading, um, leading the ADF with. And certainly the um, DVA, the Department of Veteran Affairs, has started to understand that there is a real need to emphasise technology, such as telemedicine and smartphones, um, as, a, as a key tool in trying to do this. Um, mainly because this population, like it is in the civilian population, are really existing in an online virtual space more than ever before. So again, we're hopeful that the sorts of things that might be working for young people with mental health and alcohol and other drug use disorders might be able to translate into a veteran population. So how do we actually, what do we do with all of this information? Well, first of all, we need to think about the sorts of things that are related to why people might not be seeking treatment and why um, veterans and particularly young veterans in, in particular aren't accessing treatment for their problems. So it's not because the problems aren't there at a level at which we would think they would need some sort of intervention, but certainly as I've alluded to before, there are some individual and some structural determinants that really will impact on a person's ability and decision to engage with a mental health or a drug and alcohol service. And certainly some of these sorts of things, I would say particularly a reliance on self and maybe a perceived stigma, are particularly relevant for our young veteran population. Um, and certainly those, um, I guess the males particularly, it seems to be a characteristic of males, but females as well, um, that really I need to be doing this myself, I can do this myself, I can help myself. Um, and maybe that's a young person's attitude as well, but those sorts of individual determinants will really sometimes stop help seeking um, earlier on in the piece when um, these um, I guess the prevention or intervention strategies might be effective. So what do we do? So we know these um, barriers exist, how do we overcome them? And as I've alluded to already, um, we do a lot of work at CREMS in talking about the potential of e-health and digital technologies to respond. So in order for this to have any hope of addressing these issues that I've talked about already, we really need a couple of things to be in place. So certainly recognition within our health sector that e-health and technological initiatives can really play a critical role in improving our healthcare system and also our reach as healthcare providers. Um, and, and so that's really critical. So we need clinical support, we need service support and endorsement of, of, of technology and digital health initiatives. Um, because really still at the end of the day, it's those trusted health professionals in those traditional services whom even young people are placing a lot of credibility and trust in. So if people and clinicians are saying that these are okay to use and some are okay to use, then really what we've seen in research is that uptake and use of those um, technological issues are even higher than if you don't have that clinical champion or that trusted, credible professional providing support for those kinds of initiatives. But it's not just the service um, sector that really, um, you know, is being encouraged to embrace um, e-health. Um, it's actually this increasing acceptance, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years. And what's um, important, I think, particularly in the context of, of mental health problems and drug and alcohol use problems, is that people themselves can really take a much more active role in being able to protect their own health and participate in their own health care, particularly mental health care and drug and alcohol use is included in that. So really we've seen a great shift in putting the person at the centre and the person is one of the experts in understanding and protecting and participating in their own health care and wellbeing. And we think that kind of um, emergence or that kind of transition and change has been very, very positive for individuals themselves with that lived experience of mental health and substance use problems, but also sets the scene for something like e-health and, and digital technologies to, to help realise some of these, um, these opportunities. And along with that, we've got really high rates of internet use um, amongst uh, over the world, of course, and certainly also in Australia, we have rates of around 69% 
of Australians having access to the internet. And these are stats that were um, relevant or, or taken um, at the end of last year. Certainly the highest is in North America, followed by Europe. Um, and our world average is around about 55%. So 55% of the world's population has access to the internet, which really means more than ever before, we have such an opportunity to be able to take services and digital services right to where people are and need them most. And in Australia particularly, um, the rates of smartphone use is significantly increasing, particularly over the last five years. So of the people in Australia who have a mobile phone, 84% of those, uh, what's well, projected to be 84% at the end of um, 2019, will actually have a smartphone, which means a lot of interactive features, lots of passive sensing and other types of technologies become really possible um, in helping people manage and keep track of and keep on track with their mental health and well-being. And if we don't just look at the people who own mobile phones, what that translates to is around 68 percent of the Australian population is projected to have um, a smartphone by December 2018. And so we're seeing that typical divides in terms of access to this kind of technology or access to innovation that we might have seen previously with other sorts of innovations doesn't seem to be happening in relation to smartphone and internet usage. And so again, it's a real potential to overcome some of the socio and demographic barriers to engaging in traditional services um, by using and integrating technology. The other thing that I find quite exciting um, about technology is that there is again for the first time, one of the first times, a real opportunity to overcome just about every one of the individual and structural determinants of, prevent, of um, barriers to um, treatment seeking in mental health and alcohol and other drug use problems. So certainly we've got a lot of um, a lot of promise, sorry, it's just going the wrong way, um, a lot of promise and a lot of potential for e-health um, as a tool to be able to better engage people individually and encourage them to engage with our service structures that are always there. So yay for the internet. Yay for the internet if we can demonstrate that we can actually do a good job of treating mental health and substance use problems um, using this kind of technology. And of course, you wouldn't all be here if you didn't already know the answer to that question. Um, what we've been able to demonstrate via our work at CREMS is that yes, we can actually teach people um, psychological treatment strategies and interventions and have them apply that to their own um, mental health and drug and alcohol use concerns and actually reduce their symptoms and uh, reduce their drug and alcohol consumption by doing so just via technology. So one of the first programs that um, we developed that was able to do this for comorbidities, so for comorbid depression and alcohol and other drug use was the SHADE program. So this is a 10 module program of cognitive behaviour therapy, CBT, MI, mindful uh, motivational interviewing and mindfulness based stress reduction um, strategies to try to encourage people to manage their thoughts, to develop problem solving skills, to cope with cravings, to get moving and active again and to prevent relapse to alcohol and other drug use that was ever um, ever developed. And what we did with Shades so, um, a little while ago is we offered it as a 10 week program for people and we conducted alongside of those um, technology based um, sessions, a check-in session. So actual contact with a clinician over that 10 week period where we would just check in with people around their suicide, around their mood, any issues they were having in completing the program um, and developed a bit of a plan for putting into practice the things that they were learning in the session. When we ran the first of our SHADE trials, we um, did this fairly routinely. So we would do one 10 to 15 minute session, on average it was about 16 minutes per week with a person, um, where we did just this very, very basic check-in, just, just to keep track of the person. Because I think um, up until this point, I would say in the last two years or so, really the only way we were kind of comfortable offering e-health and digital technologies was still in the context of them being embedded in some real-time um, clinician support. And I think that's that, that's still true today, but the way in which we might offer that clinician supports um, differed a little bit. Um, but for the SHADE trial I'll tell you about um, next, uh, we offered that real live check-in session, either face-to-face -face with the therapist or on the phone. We then took that SHADE treatment model and we compared it with a person-centred therapy approach. So instead of the 10 sessions being offered online for CBT, for motivation interviewing and for mindfulness, 
people came in and saw us for one session a week for 10 weeks where they received some supportive counselling style interventions. So it was still offered by our psychologists and clinical psychologists, but there was no CBT and no motivational interviewing and no mindfulness strategies um, provided. It was just an opportunity for a person to come in and set their own direction and content of the session and have a supportive, um, safe, uh, and private chat with us about what they were worried about, what their concerns were over the previous week and in general. We then compared that with the Shade Online treatment package with the check-in sessions with the therapist and a, uh, a full-on whiz-bang version of Shade, which was no computer at all, but was the Shade content offered face-to-face uh, -face by a psychologist and clinical psychologist over that 10-week session. So they would have been doing these person-centred therapy approaches and the CBT and motivational interviewing and mindfulness strategies over the 10-week period. And so really we thought that was going to be our absolute whiz-bang gold standard um, approach of those three approaches that was going to give people in our trial the best results. So who did we bring into our trial? So we had 274 people, um, just over half of them were males, they were around 40 years of age, they had reasonable levels, levels of education, um, they were um, often employed um, or they were receiving a disability or unemployment benefit and just over half of our sample were able to be diagnosed with a, um, a primary depressive disorder and the alcohol use was seen as a self-medication of the depressive symptoms, around just around 16% were able to be diagnosed with a um, substance-induced depression where the substance use was seen or the alcohol use was seen to lead to um, the depressive symptoms. But for around a third of people, we couldn't actually determine, even after plotting it all out and sitting down with them carefully, we couldn't really work out what was the chicken and what was the egg. But importantly, regardless of primacy, so regardless of what was happening to a person to bring them into the study in terms of their depression and their alcohol and the drug use comorbidity, it didn't relate to the treatment outcome. So um, people responded equally well or in the same way, regardless of whether they had a depression, a primary depressive disorder or a substance induced depression. Um, we were very, very gratified to see that people would come in, um, would attend the sessions um, equally well. And that was regardless, and we had good we had completion rates that were pretty equivalent across our three treatment conditions. And again, the number of sessions a person attended wasn't actually related to treatment outcomes, which lends a bit of weight to our idea that perhaps people come and engage with a treatment um, episode or um, an occasion of treatment for the time during which they're able to make the most change. And they might drop out and then they might come back again a bit later. And that's kind of what we thought we were seeing here. In terms of depression scores over time, we were quite, I guess, surprised, but also a bit humbled to see that there were no significant differences between our treatment groups, so any of the three treatment groups, in terms of the reductions in depression that people reported. So the most reduction occurred between baseline and our 15 week follow up periods. The treatment went for about 10 weeks. And for the most part, these lower levels, these reduced levels of depression were maintained for people right through to three years post baseline. Um, what we can see, generally, so there were no significant difference, statistically significant differences between our therapist-delivered whiz-bang version, our clinician-assisted computerised internet version, or the PCT control over time. But if you have a look at the effect science differences between three-year follow-up uh, relative to baseline, you can see that the therapist whiz-bang version of treatment and the clinician-assisted shade had roughly the same kind of effect size um, differences in depression um, as each other relative to baseline and that the PCT, although they did make, uh, that group did make some um, important reductions in depression, this magnitude was, was a little bit less than the other two active CBT MI um, groups. So that kind of says that in, you know, when people are experiencing seeing depression and alcohol and the drug use, you need you can um, get some benefits by doing some supportive counselling with people, but you, in order to get some better results, particularly for depression, you need to be building in some active CBT, motivationally doing and mindfulness type strategies, at least for our sample here. 
When we look at alcohol use over time, and this is the um, OTQ score that averages the quantity and frequency of alcohol use over the month prior to survey, and we only did this, this analysis in front of you now for those people who were um, meeting criteria for hazardous alcohol use already at entry to the study, and because we recruited people with other sorts of um, drug use disorders, not everybody met criteria for an alcohol use disorder at um, outset, that's why that number is not 274, it's 168. But again, you can see that for the most part, all of our three treatment groups were able to make significant reductions in their quantity and frequency of alcohol use over time. Now for um, every percent, and that was maintained at 12 months, at 24 months, and at 36 months post baseline for our therapist delivered CBT shade intervention and the clinician assisted shade intervention. But you can see there was a bit of relapse in the PCT control condition between two years and three year follow ups. And certainly that's also reflected in those effect size differences you can see there, comparing what's happening for a person at 36 months in terms of their alcohol use with what's happening at baseline. So again, the therapist whiz bang version and the clinician assisted shade are keeping pace with each other and the PCT condition is experiencing some relapse. So again, some further indication that you need to do more than just some supportive counselling. You need that. Um, but if you want to make some um, additional changes and particularly longer term changes in alcohol use um, over time, then you need to be doing some CBT and motivational interviewing in this comorbid group. Now, I know we know this already, but this is the first time that a computer delivered, an, a, an internet delivered intervention was able to produce these kinds of, of changes and improvements in a severely comorbid sample of people who were coming in scoring in the severe range for depression and the highly hazardous alcohol, current alcohol use. Um, at baseline. We've replicated this into this trial subsequently to this initial um, um, initial study and got the same kinds of outcomes. So again, the, the SHADE computer intervention keeps pace with a therapist delivered whiz bang intervention and is better than um, a, a PCT or other control condition. And what we also find is that um, importantly, and I think for the clinicians amongst us, is that this issue of therapeutic alliance and treatment satisfaction also appears to be the same for people who are receiving their therapy via a face-to-face -face modality all versus the shade treatment. So um, therapeutic alliance was the same. There were no significant differences and no clinically significant differences between the therapist delivered approach and the shade treatment approach. And treatment satisfaction was identical across the um, treatment groups. There was also no relationship between treatment preference and whether or not people then followed through and attended treatment. So if you, for the most part, I think there's only about 10% of our sample coming into these studies who said their treatment preference was to have the computerised or the internet or the technology-based shape treatment. Everybody wanted to talk to someone. Um, everybody wanted face-to-face -face treatment for 90% of the cases. But one of the, I guess, difficulties, but beauties perhaps of being in a research trial is that unfortunately we record preference, but that doesn't be, that's not factored into in this trial, it wasn't into which into people received. So they still had their randomization and were allocated to things that were contrary to their preference, but that didn't affect their retention rates, didn't affect their therapeutic alliance rates, and it didn't affect their treatment satisfaction rates. So even though they were coming into the study at the beginning and saying, oh, I don't know if I could engage with a computer or an internet or an e-health type program um, for my treatment, um, I'd rather talk to someone face to face. For those people who were allocated to that um, e-health treatment, they still did very, very well. There was no difference, in fact, in how well they did um, relative to a face to face treatment. But they, their perceptions of therapy, their satisfaction with therapy and the alliance they were able to build was, was exactly the same as, um, as people who, whose preferences were met. And I think that's an important clinical message as well, one for, the, the, um, for integrating e-health field, um, e-health interventions into our work. Importantly, if there was a bit of ambivalence around treatment preferences, if people didn't really care what option, which one of the options they, um, they were allocated to, then they got greater benefit, especially for their alcohol use, if they went into the shade, the online treatment condition. So we're starting to see that for some things, if people are a bit ambivalent about change or a bit ambivalent about what sort of treatment they want, um, particularly if alcohol use is around, then maybe a computerised or internet or e-health treatment is the way to go. So is this true for all people? So these studies are great and you can see we've gotten publications out of them and I'm still talking about these, uh, these treatment trials very, very fondly um, and very, very importantly, 
But as um, my, my introduction that, um, that Katrina gave me implied, I'm really keen to understand whether this is universally true for all people. And of course it's not, of course it's not. But how can we make, uh, how can we maximise the benefits and the active ingredients of these sorts of treatments, and particularly e-health treatments, which take less time um, and, and less money to deliver, and also have the potential to be able to be there when we as clinicians traditionally cannot. But is there impact and is there uh, you know, ability to engage the same for all people? And I guess so. I'm, I'm the old person in this photo, even though it's a picture of an old uh, old guy. Um, the, the stuff that I think is is important and that, that, that might work, and that is the active ingredient in in ensuring that these health interventions have universal appeal. Really surprisingly, wasn't um, what I thought it was. So I thought I was hip and jiggy with the kids and knew what um, what would work for young people in particular. But a more recent trial that uses other sorts of approaches um, really taught me a lesson. So in younger populations, the need to talk to a real person in real time meant in this subsequent trial, which was organised similarly to uh, to our Shade trial really wasn't effective. It stopped young people from engaging with us. So I thought, oh, perhaps the active ingredient and one of the main reasons why the shade online treatment was working so well was because you were still talking with the clinician, even if it was only for 10 to 15 minutes um, at a time. And so what we found when we took this to younger people was that no, that was not the case at all. They didn't want to talk to us at all. And in fact, as you can see in the graph, participation and engagement with our study significantly increased once we removed the need to talk to people um, um, in real time. And so it's all of those sorts of, um, of understandings about what we've done in civilian populations and particularly with young people that we've brought to the veteran population. So we're calling this the V-Shade Project. If anybody out there would like to join in and find out more about V-Shade, you can see the website right there, vshade.com.au. And what we're focusing on with funding from Defence Health Foundation is focusing on mood and depression and alcohol use concerns in our young veterans. So young um, veterans aged 18 to 44 years, and we're giving people access to the SHADE online treatment program. And the research part, the randomization part that we um, uh, are talking about and playing around with a little bit, is that instead of offering our clinicians support on the phone or in real time, is by engaging them with something we're calling breathing space, which is a secure um, online uh, app-based social network, works very, very similarly to Facebook and tries to, and is moderated by us clinicians. People don't have to talk to us, they can post their thoughts, um, post their questions, build social support for change um, in this space that we think is going to be much more appropriate for that younger um, age group than perhaps um, talking to a real person on the, real, on the phone uh, might have been previously. So I'll stop talking there and hopefully um, I've piqued your interest a bit in how you might work with comorbidity in general, how you might integrate digital technologies in particular and what the importance and relevance of these approaches might be for our um, younger veterans and I hope you've got some questions for me. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Francis. That was very, very interesting. I always love hearing you talk about the changes and trends in alcohol use and depression and also, what options are available for people, giving a broader access to care for people, say, in rural or remote areas or vulnerable populations like um, our veterans. So it's, it's amazing to see the work you do. So thank you for sharing. Um, so if anyone has any questions at the moment, please uh, feel free to type into the questions section on your dashboard um, and I'll read those out in a moment. Um, but I thought I would kick one off for you, Francis. Um, I was just wondering whether people can access the SHADE program outside of the trial sort of space. Oh, that's a, a good question. Actually, you can. Uh, so you just go to shadeproject.com.au and you'll be able to access that tool. It'll just involve, if you'll contact us and it'll involve an email to me. Um, but if you just email that you heard the webinar and would like um, to use the program, then I can certainly send you back a login and access to that, to that program. So it certainly is available and we would really encourage people to use it. And then tell us how, how you find it. Awesome. Great, thank you. And I was also wondering whether uh, the V-Shade program is, you mentioned that people could go on the website, is it now recruiting? Is the project recruiting? Oh, it is actually. We're in the active phase of recruitment. We um, love people to pass the word out around about the availability of the project for um, contemporary veterans. 
um, with who are worried about their mood and their um, alcohol use. And certainly they can find out more and even sign up and go straight into the screening and online assessment by going to vshade.com.au. So please come on in and, um, and uh, yes, refer people that you think might benefit from it. Awesome, sounds good. And we've just had a question come through. Uh, whether young people, I assume in the SHADE program, had a preference for SMS texts? Sure. Yes, you're exactly, exactly right. So there was a preference for um, uh, SMS over even email. So emails are an old person's thing like me um, now. So definitely SMS and even um, sending out surveys and, and things like that. People would, young people were much more responsive to invitations sent by SMS um, or by private message. So um, like the messenger function on Facebook um, or by, that's what we have built into that breathing space um, social network as well. So um, the, one of the feedback, it's anecdotal, but um, one of the young people engaged in our previous trial said, um, you know, because I, I, um, I was a bit worried that they'd post something and then I wouldn't get back to it, you know, for you know, 12 hours or so whilst I was sleeping. And that, that what they said was that they, when they feel the need to get something out and to, to I guess, have a, a download or a, a bit of event, they like doing that via messenger. They know that we'll get to it as clinicians and check in on it. And they know that it's not going to be at the time they're writing it. But when the time strikes them, they want to have a, a safe and secure environment to do that, knowing that when we come back online, maybe at 9 a.m. the next day, we will check in and then make contact with them and provide them with some feedback then. So I thought that was a really nice insight into how yeah. they are perceiving that technology. Yeah, definitely. And I've got two final questions for you before we um, end the session for today. So um, someone was just asking whether you plan to use any trans diagnostic methods um, in the SHADE program. Is there any room for changing rather than it being, I guess, um, disorder specific or is there any trans diagnostic stuff incorporated into the program? There is, and I think it's a really good question. It's a gold star for that person because so with uh, you know comorbidity, we're, we're talking about lots of uh, trans diagnoses, I guess. Um, so yes, so in the uh, I guess the updating or the um, not the updating of the Shade program, what we're doing is actually taking out a lot of the disorder specific information because a lot of the strategies that we have built into the program can actually be applied across a range of symptoms and a range of, of concerns, a range of behaviours. And so it is really important that if we want to engage people, um, you know, in this way with this technology that we are responsive to their unique um, situation and we can certainly, um, you know, we're looking to, to do that very thing is to, to tailor Shade by untailoring it, I guess, to make it applicable more broadly um, and, and, and not so disorder focused. Yeah, good answer. And the last question we've got, which is, I guess, a bit of clarification. Um, someone just mentioned that the words uh, veteran and ex-ADF are sort of used interchangeably and they were wondering whether um, you could confirm specifically whether you were talking about people who had been deployed and, and discharged from the ADF or just those who had been discharged. It might be. It's a really good question, one that we're, we're learning as well. And so what I thought was the case, we actually take it to the group that we're, uh, you know, with the lived experience that we're trying to engage with the project, all the stuff we were taking to them, you know, wasn't resonating with them at all. So uh, in, at the DVA, they talk about contemporary veterans. And in defining that, they, they define um, contemporary as, as 18 to 44 years or 45 years and that's really um, commensurate with the most recent context so any kind of conflict from the Gulf War um, to present is, is who they, they class as contemporary veterans. And that term doesn't resonate with any of the young people that we, any of the people we've spoken to who are engaged with the project so, so far. So don't use that term I guess. Um, but again, as, you, as the person's indicating, veterans can still be currently serving. So you can be better at a veteran of a conflict that's no longer an active conflict, but still be serving. And so um, making the distinction between current serving and ex-serving is really, really important. Um, that's what people are telling us anyway. Um, and everybody is a member of the ADFs, the um, Australian Defence Force. So we're trying to use current serving and ex-serving members of the Australian Defence Force to really indicate that the people for this study who are the ex-serving um, people, um, are no longer on active service and have no possibility of being called up for active um, service or deployment um, at any stage. But within the, the ex-serving group, there will be some people who have been deployed and some people who haven't been deployed. So for our study and for our purposes, 
um, whether or not someone's been deployed is not an, an eligibility or an entry criteria for us at all. Rather, we're just measuring whether that has um, uh, occurred for the person. So certainly that ex-serving group can include both deployed and non-deployed personnel. <laughs> yeah, thank you for clarifying. It's good to know a bit more about the terminology myself. It's really important, actually. It can be a, yeah, a confusing but important important thing. But, yeah, so thank you again, Francis, for today. We'll end the session um, in a moment. But, yeah, thank you for your presentation. I'm, I'm sure everyone really enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, thank you to everyone who also uh, tuned in today. It's awesome to have you with us. So there will be um, the slides and recording available on the website. I'll try and get that to you in the next day or so. And yeah, please remember that there'll be future webinars um, that you can tune into as well. The next one will be the 27th of November with Professor Thiessen. Um, and they'll be available from the CREMS website, which is www.comorbidity.edu.au, if you can remember that, good work. Um, but yes, thank you again, everyone, for um, coming along today and we'll be in, short, in touch shortly. So thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks, Francis. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.